Um, good, good afternoon, colleagues. We, we are still well on time. We are scheduled to start at uh, four past. Um, we, we are also waiting for our, our guests to join us. Um, so please have a, have a drink and as we wait for our our colleagues to join us. So we will be starting exactly at Corapest.
Uh, good afternoon again, colleagues. I think we, we can start. I initially was hoping that all our, our guest speakers will be available by now. We, we know with technology, uh, they might be joining us later. But let me take this time, uh, time to welcome everyone um, to this panel discussions. Um, I just glanced through the attendance. I've seen my two uh, DVC, um, Dr. And, and, uh, DVC Teaching and Learning and DVC Research. Welcome, colleagues. Um, initially, according to our program, we're, uh, we're going to have our first speaker uh, was going to be the Zimla president. Um, but unfortunately, I don't see him yet. So what we will do, we'll start with the colleagues who are available. Um, let me take this time and introduce um, our colleague, past president of LIASA, uh, Ms. Ujala Sako. She, she is the executive director of UCT Libraries. She is no stranger to, to University of the Free State. She was one of our experts who came to do um, a library review for us. Um, we, we also like to welcome uh, all colleagues from other institutions and around the country, all LIASA colleagues. Um, I, I'm Ujala, I know that you were supposed to be the second speaker, but may I request you that you so for the sake of time, that you, you will become our first speaker. Right, um, and, and our, our also we have our national librarian, we normally refer to them as Comrade Boss. The previous national librarian, Mr. John Sebe was saying, this is the highest seat uh, in terms of the library hierarchy. Uh, when you are a national librarian, you are the librarian of the librarians. Um, we wish you welcome, KP. I will formally introduce you when you are about to speak. As I've mentioned earlier on, Ujala Saknu is an executive director of libraries at the University of Cape Town. She is a former LIASA president, and she, she is a leader that recognizes the importance of staff development as a strategic imperative for institutional alignment and responsive. Ujala uh, holds a master's degree in information technology and a postgraduate diploma in library information science. May I take this opportunity on behalf of uh, University of the Free State to also pass, um, to express our sadness about the loss that you have suffered when one of um, your special collection was gutted by fire. We hope and, and we are also available to offer our expertise um, in rebuilding that uh, important resource for the country. Thank you. Welcome, Ujala. Thank you, Chair, and, and um, good afternoon, colleagues. And I, yeah, I greet you on behalf of UCT Libraries and the colleagues, and, and thank you very much for the invitation. But I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for the various messages of support and the outpourings of offers of assistance, sadness, and but also general encouragement to my team and myself. We desperately need your, your encouragement as well at this moment, just to keep our morale going high. Um, in terms of the um, topic that has been uh, presented to us, uh, or rather was yeah, presented to us as prospective speakers in terms of what do you need to stay afloat under these challenging circumstances? And speaking to the UCT um, uh, example, and many of you would have done this um, because I think the academic libraries in South Africa have begun to seriously recognize their role and their importance in the academic, in the academy, and that we are able to, to, to successfully partner 
the academic endeavors of any given institution within the country. And I think that comes that gives us a position of strength. The second issue for me that was very, very important when we had to go into a lockdown circumstance and practice virtually was a deep recognition and cognition that academic libraries function in a highly technologically enabled and driven environment. And I think this is where even our librarians, our, our library leadership, it, and the university leadership needs to recognize that we already function in highly technological environments. Our workflows, our platforms, our library, our integrated library management system in and of itself already places us at an advantage of how we function on a daily basis. Our operations are, are, are facilitated through the system, our offerings, our services, our catalogs, access points, etc. So the integrated nature of our system was, was the major, major critical success factor for us to be able to migrate almost seamlessly to a virtual library service. And, and that cognition actually enabled us then to be able to see what is the premises that we work on? What are the principles that we need to work on? What are the values that we need to be able to engage with? Because whilst we may have the systems, whilst we may have the capacity and the capabilities, etc., what are the guiding principles? For us, the guiding principles was a continuity of service, the ability to support the academic project, particularly teaching, learning, and the continuance of research of the university. Third was to capacitate our staff um, in terms of um, infrastructure and data, etc., so that they can continue functioning. Also, what was very, very important for us was the the um, the health well-being, health and mental well-being of our staff in terms of now having to work from home, being located at home and, and having to work from home. And what did that mean? What were the services on offer and how what was the very clear, simple message that we needed to share? on an ongoing basis so that there were no mixed messages. What were the points of access, points of entry for communication, etc. So I think when we look at all of these particular principles, it was all captured and encapsulated in the business continuity plan, which allowed us then to function seamlessly, to be able to navigate between the different levels of lockdown, et cetera, and most importantly, to be compliant to the institutional regulations and protocols in place. If I have to look at UCT at the moment as an institution, it is still functioning on the basis of a lockdown. The university campus is functioning uh, as a low density campus. And so just based on our most recent um, catastrophe, we have as a library contained that, so we're not compromising anybody. But in terms of business continuity, that has been very, very different. As, as the executive director of, of the library here, for me, it what was very important was a continued understanding of our purpose. What is our purpose? And so we had to engage with our staff as well in terms of not just a continuation of services, but how does our purpose adapt to a changing circumstance? How, how agile and responsive are we at any given time to realizing our purpose. And that was quite a robust conversation as well, because alignment to the institutional's purpose under lockdown was crucial. There had to be a shift in terms of mindset and paradigm shift 
with regards to practice around our purpose. And I, I, I suspect for many of you seated in this particular discussion that this is nothing new. Um, maybe you would have structured it and had your conversations differently, but it is nothing new because we all function on the basis of strategic planning, um, having business continuity plans, and what does that entail? So in terms of starting out, it, the business continuity plan premised on understanding of our purpose, what do we need to do to recognize this purpose and, and to achieve the purpose under lockdown? And how were we going to do that? And so there was a whole strategy that was created around virtual library services. And that is evident and available on, on our website. And, and you have been have had sight to that. The crucial aspect for me was the success of this virtual library service. And how were we doing it? And what were the underpinning values of it as well? The, the, the issue of availability, not only to students, but to, to um, academic staff was, was important. So staff became embedded in that process. Access to materials, the whole access model shifted and the engagement around acquisition of materials because you no longer could access print physical materials, tangible materials. And so migrating to e-formats, who was responsible for that? How do we ensure that? So migrating the acquisition model as well was very, very important. So the team that was focusing on that and the budget allocated to that was, was very crucial. We actually moved a lot of our print budget to ebooks. And over the course of last year, and we're still doing it at the moment, we spent a lot of money in bolstering our e-collections. And obviously, like all the other institutions, we took great advantage of all the vendors who gave additional access to resources, et cetera. So that, that was very useful. We put on hold all orders of physical materials and redirected that budget. And the turnaround time actually served as a highlight in shifting perceptions of academics and the role of the library in providing materials. So being able to provide an almost um, instant service within a couple of hours, you already had access to a material enabled a drastic shift as well. The responsiveness of the librarians to queries and and the 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 deep deep caliber of responses, etc. And the the I think the careful considered way in which we engaged with um, academics allowed for that shift to happen. So one of the things that we've always been grappling with as librarians is how do we journey? How do we build relationships with academics, etc.? And the the virtual library services and the the lockdown gave us those opportunities to become more closer and to become part of the, 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 the formulation of the curricula and the online teaching, et cetera. And, and we were able to see, based on sur surveys that were conducted by our Center for Innovation and Learning Technologies, et cetera, that of all the services that were provided to students via the online learning or remote learning program, the libraries came up as tops in all the surveys they conducted. So that was that gave us the confidence to be able to say, yay, we are doing something right. We are still continuing with our purpose and we were able to realize it through the services we are providing. But it also became very clear that the perceptions of the library and the perceptions towards librarians have shifted tremendously because we actively promoted the idea of working with your librarian to achieve your online teaching program. You want to create your resource list, work with your librarian. You want to do online searches, 
work with your librarian because many of of, of many students etc would just go and 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 go onto the catalog or browse the shelves even even our academics and researchers and so the shift has happened consistently evidence of the success of the model that we embraced is evident on an ongoing basis however i must admit that keeping afloat has not been the easiest because cr a crucial aspect is staff well-being and how we manage to avoid staff having serious mental issues, um, anxieties, panic, um, depression, etc. We we addressed it head on. The university worked on the basis of the values of kindness, care and compassion, and that underpinned all our decisions that underpinned all my engagements with my team and their engagements with their teams, etc. So no person felt alone or isolated in this entire journey. It was my personal responsibility to ensure that every staff member was in a healthy state of being. And so we worked on a monthly basis with the institutional counseling and, and, and um, advisory services to host emotional impact sessions. And once we started seeing that staff were being directly and indirectly affected by COVID, we had several staff who were tested positive. Some were hospitalized, some had to go into isolation. We had two deaths in, in, from our team, etc. So the impact thereof was very important to address head on. We did not ignore the issue, but we took it on head on. And so that has been very good. From January this year, we also started looking at grief and loss under COVID-19 because your standard grieving, grief counseling was not adequate. And so what we started asking for was a shift in that kind of counseling so that we address the isolation, the fear, the anxiety that still persists around COVID-19 and how do you manage loss. The one thing that made it very insightful for me was being part of these sessions and getting to realize that staff are still struggling from recovery uh, with their recovery from having had COVID-19. And so we've created this awareness in terms of it's not business as usual when you are, when you are back on uh, back at work after being tested ne negative uh, um, um, after yeah after isolation, etc. So bearing in mind all of that, we had to also then start looking at coming back to campus. We had to look at the state of health because remember libraries are contact spaces. It's, it is about the people that work here in the libraries, etc. So whilst the services are still in place, the virtual library service is functioning in the background. Our spaces are now being opened as study spaces. We don't have any transactional services. Um, or contact transactional services in place. It is still the, the email uh, pick up and go, the request email pick up and go, the scan and email for research inquiries, etc. Because if you're browsing the collection, then materials need to go into the contamination and fumigation room, etc. So we've, we've not permitted we haven't permitted browsing, etc. So all our libraries currently are being used only as study spaces and the system we have put into place is working excellently well. Um, colleagues, it's an ongoing um, cognition of how the circumstances are changing on campus and you have to be part 
of the decision making that's happening at a campus level. As library director, as library managers, etc., you have to journey with the university. You have to have regular engagements with our health and safety consultants, etc., so that your space that is now being used by students is free of any potential um, clusters, cluster risk. Your staff who are on a shift basis, their health is, is always upheld as an important priority. How do we ensure that their health is maintained in that way? The continued mental and health um, state of being must be addressed. We are now having this added um, I won't say burden, but pressure of coping with grief and loss based on the, the fire that has happened. And so how do we integrate that? So staying afloat is open to interpretation. And one of the things in terms of a business decision to stay afloat means that you have to have access to a budget that hasn't been cut. And I can very confidently say that our budget was not cut. It was maintained at the 2020 um, levels for 2021. Our information resources had a built in, had a built in um, excess to cover any um, exchange, the, the volatile exchange rate VAT and obviously annual increases, but we did not have annual increases. We did not terminate any of our subscriptions, etc. So this comes about based on an understanding of your purpose, the role that you play within the academy and being able to demonstrate that value to the academy through the surveys, actively engage with it. And third, being very transparent with university management about what are some of the challenges, but always being one step ahead. And I can tell you confidently that if you manage your library services with a sense of trust, confidence in um, our ability to deliver, making sure that your capacities, your capabilities are on par with what is required for the university. There shouldn't be any reason for you not being supported by the university management, for you to be present in the remote teaching arena, for you to be present within the, 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 the ambit of your academics, and most importantly, being available to your students whether it's 24 seven online or as a, a study space. And with those few words, thank you very much, colleagues. Charlie, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, thank you colleagues. Um, the process that you're going to follow, we're not going to take any questions for individual speakers. We would like all the speakers and then we will tackle the questions right at the end or come. If not, let me take this opportunity to welcome and introduce Mr. Kepi Madumo. As I've indicated, she's an, he's a national librarian, South African uh, national librarian. And um, she, he is a, you would remember uh, colleagues that uh, this branch of Liasa in Free State was the one that was key when when this position became vacant after um, the departure of Professor Rocky, Russell BP, um, where the, the, the advert was such that anybody who is not a professional librarian could take that position. And this branch, Univers uh, Free State branch, took this matter up and even ran a, um, um, 
ran a, a campaign whereby they forced the, the Department of Arts and Culture Sports and, and the board of the National Library of South Africa to advertise the position uh, with the requirement of a librarian. And we are glad today to welcome KP Madumo, who is an, who is an experienced librarian who has served as a director in provincial library services and archives in the Northwest province. Among other positions, he was with the city of Johannesburg and the city of Uruleni. Mr. Mr. Madumo holds a master's degree in library and information science from the University of Cape Town. He currently serves as a CEO, as I've mentioned, and the national librarian. Thank you, welcome, KP. He's going to give us an, uh, from the, as, as we're listening to Jala coming from the academic side, we're going to listen to our national librarian who's going to give us an idea in terms of how the public libraries are coping with COVID. Thank you. You can unmute KP, it's over to you. Thanks, sorry, I, I was talking and I realized that, uh, thanks for reminding. I was saying thanks very much uh, program director and my fellow colleague Meu Jala, uh, the executive director for uh, libraries in the University of Cape Town, my alma mater, and we, I think, we sh uh, share the same pain that you are sharing experience and uh, losing very valuable collection. As custodian of these heritage assets, we, we are at pain uh, with you. I think this is another uh, unprecedented crisis that we also find ourselves as, as a profession and, uh, and, and sharing all these uh, experiences, learnings and, and, and approaches to approach our, our new normal that we are confronted with. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's a counseling process on its own, I, think I can only assume. But Chair, to start my input into the topic, yeah, I think when the President announced on that uh, evening that as a country we are entering into the national disaster uh, lockdown uh, and, and all we are affected by the regulations. Uh, I think it was a clear indication that uh, change is inevitable. And they always say you either adapt or, or you die. And we all had to find a way of adapting uh, through the crisis, but we eventually turn that crisis into an opportunity. And I think as my colleague was talking, you can attest that uh, from the experience that we all went through through this uh, crisis, uh, there were quite very valuable lessons that we have learned. And I think they have shaped us to be better people and to be better uh, institutions. And uh, as the National Library and also uh, public libraries generally, I think uh, we had to come up with very creative ways uh, when our doors were temporarily closed uh, to the public. And, and 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 it was a clear indication that the the COVID-19 crisis has uh, compromised the traditional offering of, of of library services. But as I've already indicated, that presented us with uh, an opportunity. And then I know one of my board member who's very well known, uh, Dr. Buche. She kept reminding us that. Uh, let's look at the positive out of this misery uh, called COVID-19. And I think that's the statement 
uh, that kept all of us uh, <laughs> uh, as we remain closed, as we remain closed, our doors closed, public libraries as the National uh, Library. And I think one of the first things that we did as the National Library was to uh, help uh, develop a protocol framework uh, that eventually assisted the public libraries to open uh, when the regulations were, were relaxed. But uh, we have seen a lot of public libraries uh, coming up with innovative ideas uh, of offerings and, 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 and a, a very uh, interesting one is uh, the city of Johannesburg. And if you, I mean, uh, social media platforms were used to reach out to the users as we know that uh, public libraries are also a social space for, for the community for the communities. And uh, I mean, here alone at the National Library, we house in the Pretoria campus close to uh, 2,000 uh, library users uh, on a single day uh, if we operate normally. You can imagine what happened to uh, those patrons who were expecting uh, to come to the library. But I think the remote offerings of our services while our doors were closed uh, kept us in constant contact uh, with our users. And uh, as I've indicated, one of the uh, groundbreaking uh, social media offerings that were issued by uh, the city of Johannesburg to give an example, uh, which also allowed them to uh, be bestowed with an award of being active during the COVID-19. I mean, their storytelling uh, initiative. And I, I mean, I, I mean, as old as I am on a daily basis, uh, during my spare time, I will switch on and listen to to the storytellings that were offered uh, by the library. And, and I think maybe uh, because we are all under that strain, uh, you know, you had to find an escape to, to enjoy something uh, that was offered. And that's when you realize that uh, uh, we have very capable and innovative librarians. But just to also share, I mean, you know, as the National Library, when universities doors were closed and everybody was unlocked, I think we were inundated with so many uh, requests by a uh, university student because they all had to come back home and all that. And they wanted uh, access to uh, library resources, to space. But we, uh, during that period, we, we had to make available some of our collection uh, remotely, and, and, and we were able to have a nation, a plan that outlines some phase in approach uh, to accommodate uh, our library users. And, 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 and when the, the, the lockdowns were regulations were eventually uh, relaxed. We did some phasing approach to open the library for study papers and also to uh, use some of our material uh, uh, pre-request and, and the librarian will prepare the material for the user, package them, put them on the designated areas, and when the users have uh, done using the material, then they will it will be taken to the quarantine room. Uh, and and, and it, it worked quite uh, effectively and efficiently, and we, we never experienced any uh, COVID-related incidents. 
uh, since we open our our library uh, to the public. And 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 on the issue of staff, uh, I mean the concept of working from home uh, was also new. Uh, and and considering that majority of our work in the national library is quite labor intensive, it requires people uh, to be in the office. We had to also come up with that uh, uh, the platoon system where we had to rotate uh, on a weekly basis. Some staff will come in and some will uh, will be work from home. But uh, critical to that, we also had to adjust our uh, annual performance plan uh, to revise our target because uh, we had a contract with the public in terms of the promises that we do as as government in terms of service delivery, and 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 that annual performance plan had to be adjusted to accommodate the new normal and and also being mindful that uh, we are working on uh, reduced staff capacity and you know that when you work on a reduced staff capacity uh, productivity level also uh, gets affected and 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 uh, equally to that i i mean i i was jealous when uh, Ujala was saying that they never experienced any budget cuts. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we experienced uh, two budget cuts in one financial year. And the final straw, it was when our human resource budget was also cut. And you see, the challenge is that all these new offerings, uh, whether digitally or online, uh, requires resources. And when you experience these budget cuts and you have to innovate, come up with new mechanisms of delivering your service and you, you experience budget cuts, it definitely makes your, your, your life uh, difficult. And we, when we introduced our opening to the public, we had to reduce our hours uh, and, and opening days. Uh, I mean, ordinarily we open from Monday to, uh, to Saturday and, and we had to open three times a day, uh, three times a week uh, from nine o'clock until 12 o'clock. And, and from between one, between 12 and one, we allow the cleaning staff to uh, disinfect, sanitize the area. And again, from uh, one o'clock until uh, 16 hour, we, we open the library. And then after the library has closed, we allow again the cleaning staff to uh, sanitize and ensure that the safety of our users is up to standard and the emphasis was uh, on ensuring both the safety of our staff and 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 and, and the members of the public and as i've indicated uh, since we have opened to the public uh, we can safely say that we never experienced uh, any uh, incident uh, related to positive cases uh, coming from uh, the library users because we primary objective we made the point that uh, the safety of our users is paramount and and the necessary screening are uh, being performed at our uh, main entrances and we our IT team was very innovative we developed uh, an, an electronic uh, registering app where the library users don't have to fill papers. Uh, we deployed uh, app, uh, uh, some gadget at our entrances where uh, the users come and use and those gets uh, disinfected as and when the, uh, the users have touched the, the gadget. But also 
uh, in addition to that, we also had what we call uh, Ask a Librarian, where users who can't come uh, will send their queries through email or telephone and, and arrange for, for, for pickup of the resources that uh, they, they, have, they have requested. And uh, one of the exciting uh, project that we were able to uh, to do was the establishment of our research as the national library we were able to uh, register i mean uh, the creation of this unit uh, basically uh, put us at par to make sure that uh, we adequately respond to all these uh, challenges that are being brought by the changes uh, brought by COVID in terms of ensuring that we are always innovative and come up with new ways of uh, responding to our need to the library users' needs, and and also reinvent ourselves. And and uh, we are also in the process of uh, embarking on the organizational redesign, because we strongly believe that uh, the future dictates uh, new skills and new roles. And last night I was reading a very interesting article. Uh, from the World Economic Forum, the the jobs of the future. And uh, they are saying that the jobs of the future, one of it which we always call a support function, IT, uh, is no longer going to be a, a support function in the future. It is uh, primarily going to be one of the core uh, business of every organization. We have relegated IT. And you can clearly see it considering that now we all talk about uh, the four IR. And uh, just to quote from uh, Professor Marawa, Marwala, uh, when, she, when he talks about uh, the future of the library, I quote, the future library is bigger than all world historical libraries combined and smaller than a book on one of those library shelves. So I think the above statement by uh, Marwala uh, simultaneously uh, present a challenge as well as a solution to, to libraries in respect of addressing uh, the disruptive changes that we have experienced uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. But also, uh, and, and, and I know uh, Ujala and her team, they are quite close to the devastation that uh, the fire has engulfed uh, at the University of Cape Town. And, and it's, it's a clear indication that uh, we require a new skill set as leaders, as managers, and as librarians in order for us to be fit for a purpose uh, for the future. And we know that uh, uh, the future basically uh, requires us to respond differently from all these experiences. And if we honestly fail to adapt to these changes, I don't think we will be ready to navigate uh, uh, through the future. And one of the issues that managed to help us survive was our COVID response plan. And as management, and we together with uh, led by our safety officer, we developed a comprehensive uh, a COVID-19 response plan. And I can honestly say that plan uh, managed to help us to survive and to be where we are today. And yeah, and, and the emotional part of it was when we lost staff members and we had uh, our own staff members who were who contracted COVID 
and 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 uh, not at the workplace. Fortunately, uh, majority they were at home, and 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 yeah, uh, the, the 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 emotional part of dealing with death at the workplace, uh, I think, is the mammoth task, and 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 that's when you see the impact of COVID uh, manifesting itself to your employees. And 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 fortunately, we we had a, a, a service provider, ICAS, who was also available to support, to provide counselling to all our staff members who who were affected, uh, either from the family side and, and 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 from the colleagues. But yeah, I think that's the the, the important part. Uh, that as a manager uh, through the COVID uh, experience, it was honestly difficult to deal with this uh, emotional emotional part when uh, your staff were really impacted, and 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 you have to ensure that you provide the crying shoulder uh, to to all the staff members. But all in all, uh, program director. Maybe just to yeah to to wrap up in terms of the the, the yeah the future uh, of, 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 of looking for the future and 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 uh, for us the organizational re redesign uh, for the national library becomes key because we strongly believe that uh, there are certain roles that need to change. And there are certain roles that needs to uh, to be redesigned, and 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 uh, I think the cherry on top uh, was when we were asked to submit a proposal uh, to the department and national treasury when the president announced the presidential stimulus package, and we submitted a proposal to digitize the National Library Collection, and uh, we were uh, allocated additional 30 million for the National Library uh, uh, to digitize its collection. If, recalling that most of our collections are physically housed, and COVID-19 uh, has shown us that uh, we need to accelerate online access to all these heritage uh, resources. And it's a project that uh, we feel uh, it needs to be accelerated uh, so that uh, library users don't have to physically come to us. And uh, it can also be used as part of the resource sharing with all the researchers uh, everywhere in the country and in the continent. So 4IR becomes the order of the day. I thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Boss. It would be nice to for the colleagues to see our the boss of the bosses. If you can switch on your camera and um, some were complaining to me to say, hey, we want to see the national librarian. Um, if you can just switch on your camera for a few minutes whilst I'm, I'm addressing the, the following issues. Colleagues, um, I've just received a message I from... My camera is not on. I thought it was on. <laughs> no, it was not on. You can switch it on now. Is, is it, it on now? Ten, it says turn off the camera. Not yet. Uh, I think something is wrong. Unless the... You can you can you can use uh, some few thousands from from the budget from the national treasure and buy a, a laptop national. <laughs> uh, I'm using <laughs> MacBook, so I'm yeah. surprised that uh, yeah, yeah. The, the host can check from. Uh, let me see. Uh, I don't know what's happening. Okay. Uh, more action. Yes, colleagues, I've just received the communication from AFLIA president um, and the CEO and uh, director for South African Library of the Blind. She is currently booked uh, for some, um, the, his PA was not around, so he, could, he was 
unable to inform us on time, but there's an uh, important meeting that is currently attending at two um, for, for, for both the legal deposit. So he won't be joining us, which gave us enough time to engage with the with the speakers that have just spoken now. Um, I was trying to confirm with Mr. Madiba if Mr. Shedrecht has already joined us. Uh, Shedrecht Ndide. I'm not, yeah, I think, uh, I'm not sure because he did test uh, earlier, he did test the connection. It was working and he also sent us his presentation because he, he had a PowerPoint presentation. If he's not is not going to join us by the time we have finished our discussions, we would uh, we would share his presentation because he, Mr. Ndite is a is a is an academic, is an information librarian academic, um, and um, not only that, but he has a strong interest in technology. So he, he was going to share with us his experiences, um, what they were doing, uh, how they were handling COVID in Zimbabwe. Um, um, he's, he's the current Zimla president, which is an equivalent of Liasa in Zimbabwe. He's the current president. Um, so unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be here. Um, I will take this opportunity and open up for questions um from from the from the colleagues um before that i would just like to say thank you to ujala and and kepi for for the presentations um we we can i think there are quite few things that we we we, we can share uh, that we we can see that we, we we are almost in the same um wavelength and uh, the experiences that we're experiencing um, and and we can look at you, you normally you look at these institutions that are highly ranked and you try and match them and i can tell you now that uh, ujala uh, free state um, uh, could be running away with it in terms of uh, the the way the services that you're offering to librarian it would be nice if some of our colleagues would be sharing their experiences because i think we've got about um, 30 minutes from now, 30 minutes to, 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 it could be a question. If you're asking a question, you can indicate who you're asking, you want to answer the question, or you can, you can either raise your hand, the, the, the Microsoft meetings allow you to raise your hand, you can raise your hand, or you can type on the chat, and then I can ask the question on your behalf. I'm opening up the floor. Uh, Mr. Program Director. Yes, Jeanette. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this uh, event for the University of the Free State. This is really a, a, a great opportunity for us. We, we, we really are very, very happy and, and led for the stance that you took and uh, invited the gurus, you know, big shots in, in the profession to come in and, and share with, with, with us and the country. Um, uh, developments that are going on. And I also, from my side, um, want to thank and congratulate the, the two colleagues for the amazing work that they are doing at their respe respective uh, institutions. Uh, I think both uh, presentations have given us some food for thought uh, I, as well as the University of the Free State with regard to what trends, although we are implementing most of the of the things that uh, our uh, colleagues are implementing in their respective institutions. I just want to say from our side that, you know, we, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are very, very thankful and grateful that you took your time and, and, and joined us and, and, you know, came and presented to us the University of the Free State. We, invite, we have invited our Liasa branch because we have a very, very um, active branch. So they are also here, they have joined us. And uh, I just wanted to, you know, just to express my appreciation for this gesture. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, 
Jeanette. Um, any other question or comment, colleagues? Uh, program director. Yes, Madiba. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity and thanks to to both uh, the two colleagues. Um, it was very interesting listening to them, and uh, I was like dotting down some of the very interesting uh, 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 information that they're sharing, you, the words that they are using, <coughs> reinventing, thinking out of the box, shift in mindset, creativity, adapt or you die, and also grabbing the, 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 the opportunities. So those are the words that I'm taking away from this, uh, from their presentation. Uh, the question is, is, is I'm posing it to both of them. It's a little bit general. Uh, I, I'm also quoting from the from the World Economic Forum uh, something that I read also recently that uh, some of the commentators, especially the scientists, they are warning us that we are likely to have these uh, 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 pandemics quite often uh, because of how we we treating the 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 the, the world that we, we we're living in. I just want to find out from them uh, their opinion. Uh, with the, the benefit of hindsight as to how do you think we, sh or we should uh, prepare ourselves uh, uh, for, for future uh, pandemics? Thank you. Thank you, Monde. We'll take other questions. I hope they're noting it down, uh, Ujala and Kepi. Um, we have Leticia Leke. Thank you, Program Director, and good afternoon, colleagues. And thank you very much to the uh, two colleagues for very informative and interesting um, presentations. Uh, this is really much appreciated. Um, I just want to, um, my question is raised at uh, Ms. Ujala Satgur in terms of um, when she was saying that the libraries, um, oh, by the way, I'm from UNISA and I'm at the Rustenburg Library, um, a, a branch from UNISA. Um, how do you say, you said that in the background, virtual libraries are continuing whilst the libraries are used as study space. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious with regards to this specific statement you've made, Ms. Uchala. Um, does it mean when they are there, yes, study space, when they just sit and study and the virtual library, so the staff are basically at the libraries and those students that's currently using the space for study spaces, are they, when they in front of a um, computer or a laptop, um, whilst they corresponding or speaking to the librarian currently there. I'm, I'm just curious about that because it sounds so good and interesting because yes, as my previous, um, the previous colleague was saying, we use the same, um, most of us use the same system and we also implement exactly the same um, what what was done at other libraries and the discussion. So I would just like to know about the access and the virtual library in the background and the students using the library as study space. Thank you, program director. Thank you, Leticia. I'll take Jeanette and then I'll give the colleagues to respond. I think it's an old hand. I'll put it down. <laughs> <laughs> Problems of it being a teacher, you know. Yes. Uh, th thank you. Um, over to you, um, colleagues. Uh, Maybe Kepi can go first so that uh, Ujala can address the two questions also. No, thanks. Uh, maybe let me start with the first one, how to prepare for the, for the future pandemic. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, when the COVID-19 came, we were in the process of reviewing our, uh, both our risk management plan and the, uh, uh, the, 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 the other uh, famous plan, uh, I'll just remember. Uh, and usually when we plan for, for disasters, we never pay attention to pandemics. I think we, our focus all along in planning for disasters and all that, it was all around uh, uh, if the building burns, if 
uh, this and that happen, and and it it basically showed that uh, our, our planning for future should take cognizance or uh, into the all the various forms of of pandemics, and and who ne we never thought that we will work from home uh, uh, for such a long time, and the libraries will will be closed. And one of the things that I can recommend, and I think uh, I know Ujala also posted uh, in one of the social media platform that uh, perhaps again, it's high time that we Come here. Uh, we have some national dialogue around uh, disasters in, in libraries, because I know the National Library has been running uh, library disaster workshops no beef. For, for, for quite some times, but uh, I don't think that uh, they, they prepared us uh, to these eventualities. Maybe to advise on, on how to prepare uh, uh, for the future. I think annually, and, and it's been also highlighted that one of the future skills that is required for managers and everyone in the future is risk management. And I think that's the core critical skills that we all need. And I, I, I know in the past we used to relegate it to uh, if you work in a big institution, your your risk and compliance unit that will come annually do that exercise uh, for you and prepare that document keep it for themselves but i think it's critical now that as part of our way of doing things as libraries regardless of how small we are we feature risk management in our management agenda on a constant basis and it gets uh, monitored and 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 uh, on a regular basis, and I think then we will be ready uh, to manage any kind of disaster uh, for the future. And 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 I think that will be my my recommendation. I think there will be a need for a a, a, a intensive training on on risk management uh, for 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 librarians uh, 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 going forward. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you colleagues for those questions. I'm going to um, respond to the shorter one around study spaces because um, I think the first question that was asked will require a slightly longer response. Please excuse that noise. We still have um, helicopters and planes flying over just monitoring the situation. OK, in terms of study spaces, when we decided that we will open up our libraries as study spaces, it did not mean that we had the full complement of staff back on site. We are working with um, a very small group of uh, staff on site who are actually taking care of all the email requests that we receive. And because they now have access to physical materials, the scan and email service continues, um, interlibrary loans can continue, and then also those who wish to, to borrow materials, we the, the staff collect the, the, the materials and we have collection diaries and schedules. So, that that's where we are utilizing our staff. That's where we are utilizing our staff to support. Sorry, that was a defense force helicopter and they're thinking of coming on board as volunteers because we desperately need volunteers. So I'm glad to see that the defense force may be coming. OK, so the staff role here is largely to support the requests received um, via the virtual library services. We do not have staff on site 
doing transactional reference work, etc. All of that is done online and many and majority of our staff are still working from home. So the virtual library service at the moment is our primary mode of delivery. Managing future pandemics, none of us, none of us anticipated something of this nature. However, what I think is very important is to recognize that the world of work is changing and it's been changing over a long period of time. And to what extent did we start future proofing our workspaces, our libraries and our thinking around a changing world of work. And that's a crucial conversation that has to be held by all academic libraries. How future proofed are we? What is our thinking around our changing world of work and how this year has precipitated, catapulted us into a different paradigm completely. And that is why I, in some cases I see paralysis. In some cases, people still trying to do things differently with the old mindset. And mm -hmm. some who are saying, you know what, hey, this is a great opportunity. Let's do it. Let's see what we have and how we are able to seamlessly migrate. And that's the kind of language and thinking we must must adopt because we as an entity on a campus at a university, libraries tend to take the lead in terms of the use of technologies, etc. And so how are we optimizing that? To what extent are we upskilling our staff and reskilling uh, our staff in terms of navigating now this digital space, the use of new tools? And they're not new tools. There are tools that we had and which we took for granted and said, oh, we don't really need it. So we need to be very, very cognizant of what do we have at our disposal, et cetera. And I'm using the, the pandemic not, or not as a defining moment. It is a moment that has forced us to think differently. And it's precipitated us and forced us to start thinking futures. And so we need to look and say, how are we going to do that? The other issue that we need to seriously consider is how do we mainstream virtual library services? Mm -hmm. It shouldn't only be in response mm -hmm. to a pandemic and a lockdown. We now realize that in addition to contact service, virtual library service is a mainstream service. Our plan is to have people dedicated to virtual library services, building on it on a regular basis. What are the new ways of communicating? What are the new tools that we can invest in, etc.? And how do we make the both the contact and the virtual mainstream services for us? Kepi has touched on risk management, but we need to look in terms of risk not only in terms of the physical library, but what are the other risks associated with us being able to execute and deliver on our purpose, our mandates, etc. So there's a lot of strategic thinking that has to happen. Yes, technology is an enabler. However, we should recognize that our what is our role, what is our purpose and how do we adapt? The notion of going completely virtual, is that the way we, we need to consider our future services and only use our libraries as study spaces? Is it a hybrid? How do we support the hybrid? Is it a time now for collaboration, resource sharing? How do we engage, etc.? So when we have to think about managing the future, I'm not talking about managing our services because of the pandemics. My take and my thinking is how do we manage the future and what are the opportunities it presents to us? Thank you. Thank you, Ujala. Um, there's a question from Prof Kohli, but I will take it after we we have you can you can ponder over it. 
Um, we wish to welcome Shedrek Ndide, um, the current president of Zimla, uh, who's going to share with us. We have uh, welcome Shedrek. We have already introduced to you. Um, a lot of people are looking, were looking forward to see you and hear you. Um, let's take this opportunity. Um, let's um, this time now allow you to give us your presentation. Thank you. Over to you, Shetrek. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Shadrantinde from Zimbabwe, representing Zimbabwe Labor Association. Um, I'm presenting on labor developments uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. How do I? Hello? Uh, it's fine, Shetrek. She'll control the slides for you. You can just say next slide, and then Peter okay. will control it. Uh, next slide. Right, uh, Zimbabwe introduced uh, uh, the first slide. The first slide, sir. Hello? Yeah, I think maybe um, Nambita, will you allow him to uh, up, uh, present so that he, we don't upload it, so that he can control it from his side? Are you hearing me? Can you hear us, Shedrek? I can hear you. Are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you. Also, let me just present from my slides. Then I will... You, you, yeah, I, you can... You can say next slide, we can see uh, from our side, you can see your slides. So you can present from your side and then just say next slide, and then Nambita will control the slides from our side. Okay, so uh, I'm presenting on leverage development in Zimbabwe during the COVID-19 pandemic. That's my area. Then slide number two. Right, Zimbabwe introduced uh, an embargo. It's like the ban uh, movement uh, due to coronavirus and this was on the 28th March when the government announced the national lockdown to be implemented within 40, 48 hours. All citizens had to remain in their homes for 21 days. So here we have the president saying only those who were in the essential services should uh, go to work or to visit uh, people who had problems. And unfortunately, the library part was uh, not part of the essential services. So it was a doom to the library fraternity. And then if you look at what was happening in Africa from the uh, Africa Association, uh, the uh, Association of African Universities, they indicated that educational institutions have been uh, ordered to close a way, as a way of containing the spread of COVID. And this led to obstruction of just imagine seven, 776 million children and youth, including uh, library users. This was a very, very uh, big issue to consider. So according to Cox, um, 2020, COVID-19 caused major changes in the way academic libraries uh, do their business. COVID-19 blindsided all libraries activities in Zimbabwe, that is academic libraries, school libraries and public libraries. They were all affected by this COVID-19. So I looked at uh, challenges caused by the pandemic in Zimbabwe. Uh, the sudden lockdown of, uh, on the 27th March uh, 2020 caused some serious implications in all libraries, be it public, be it academic and school libraries. The most common is that not all books, resources that had been checked out to members were turned out. You see, that was a very, very uh, big challenge. Was people, uh, usually students had borrowed books from universities, libraries, and in academic libraries, even in public libraries, but they could not retain them. So this was a very uh, challenging uh, uh, problem. So opening of the academic libraries was now done in phases. And uh, the opening hours have been reduced as well has a reduced number of patrons per opening period. And librarians were now, as uh, Ujala said, they need to be strategic in issuing or in their business. So 
COVID-19 pandemic in Zimbabwe, according to Zimla report, posed a challenge to the librarians with the decision making on who is to be admitted to the library and at what time. Uh, according to Cox, uh, he noted that uh, due to COVID pandemic, library staff uh, was forced to work from home and there was a sense of overburden because of internet connectivity in Zimbabwe. Like today, I just received uh, power just some few minutes away from, uh, uh, just away from now. So it is just, you just imagine how librarians are affected. They cannot connect to their patrons. They cannot connect to the library. So this, could, uh, it was a very big challenge. Then uh, how did they operate during those uh, times? So due to the close of, uh, of schools and higher educational institutions, there's been a shift from face-to-face -face instruction to online lecture uh, delivery and preventive measures were put in place to keep spread of the disease. So you'll find that uh, librarians then who were in information service departments or who were delivering information uh, resources to their patron, they diverted to online uh, lecture or online de delivery methods. So the Zimbabwe Library Association created information briefs. We had uh, some webinars, we have some collaborative uh, uh, discussions with uh, our librarian fraternities, those who are in diaspora, like the one, uh, like those who are in South Africa, United States, and uh, our uh, guys. So the information brief provided the general information about the virus, uh, resources for patrons, mental health and COVID-19 uh, resources for libraries and pandemic uh, planning guides. So library moved to online services and work from home. But not all libraries were open uh, to this uh, channel of information delivery. Some were totally closed. Like all public and school libraries were totally closed with no operation taking place because they were deemed an, uh, not an essential service. Then public library operations, I'm looking at public libraries in Zimbabwe. Basically, I took this information from a, a, a well-established library in Lawa in Zimbabwe, Matagaliland uh, province. And so they created membership databases and they disseminated information to members through the bulk SMEs, like through the phone uh, messages. And Amnest was extended for all books due to uh, who due, due during the COVID lockdown because the, it was not their fault because the library was unexpectedly closed without their notification. So there was an amnesty to say, just bring the book, no fines. So the library was featured on Twitter. You see, well, now they now use uh, social media or Twitter, and that is the Twitter page which reached over 1,000 people. Uh, people every month on a drive to raise awareness. That's the public library. So only initiative. As the central instruments required by the municipality, they bought a thermometer uh, to ensure that all patrons who frequented the institution are checked and are within the prescribed temperature to reduce risk. This was done by security at the doors. Then they also have sanitizers which were acquired and made available to all entry points and service stations. Opening times were changed from uh, 10 o'clock in the morning up to 3 uh, in the afternoon. Then to guarantee social distance measures, uh, the number of patrons, uh, measure, it was the number of patrons was limited. Posters on COVID awareness were acquired and from some from Casava Smart Tech, this is a service provider which opted to give uh, these uh, posters opening uh, like uh, and some photocopied and posted around the library. This was just an awareness campaign within the public library to minimize the number of staff members. Rotational, uh, uh, they were rotated. Uh, this was uh, there was a rotational shift which was introduced by the library, and the books were retained. The books retained were isolated for 48 hours, and they were shelved after. This was just to try and minimize or save away this pandemic. So the pandemic opened in other uh, public libraries, it opened doors for development, thinking in other terms or thinking uh, within the perimeter of what has been started. 
So an electronic learning platform was uh, called learning, uh, learning management system was designed at one of the uh, uh, public library and also college library, a teaching uh, college library. This meant that our students, the students uh, were able to learn online, submit their assignments and so forth. But now for the library, they uploaded e-resources which will support the, 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 the teaching and learning uh, that was taking place. This was a plus for the library and the, the, it was now visible. And the, if it is taken on, it can be taken on to other libraries. Then there was this online platform on WhatsApp and Facebook uh, chat. Uh, these were created on WhatsApp and Facebook. On this platform, users gave their queries and were assisted with online information sources in line with their needs. And this is a popular, uh, this was a popular uh, platform, the WhatsApp, and which I will showcase is in the next slide. The library partnered with local women. This was just an innovative uh, skill developed by the public libraries, whereby they wanted to women to show uh, these face marks and they delivered, uh, they, they distributed them to their users at a, a minimum price. So from February to March uh, 2021, a total of 8,700 face marks have been, were, were, were made at one of the public libraries in Machine of Zimbabwe. Then for academic libraries, we're talking of university libraries, special libraries, they used one, they used radio, a radio station was established at one of the universities, that is Great Zimbabwe University, and reader services was given chance to uh, uh, unpack their services uh, marketing their services and also teach uh, students how to access their online uh, web uh, resources from the Great Zimbabwe based website. And the, some universities are following up with uh, getting some licenses. And this is a good development which uh, our African uh, friends can take that the radio can be used to disseminate information to users if they are accessible. Then the WhatsApp, uh, the Facebook, Instagram for pictures. This was just a marketing tool. Then the Twitter, and also in Zimbabwe, the ZTV, the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation and TV. Uh, they offer some tutorials to students. So librarians will just have the, they will just uh, focus on having students at one place and it, uh, let them see or teach them or follow the, the discussions there. So there were there were some librarians in, in, in other provinces who took a voluntary who took voluntary services, community services where they just had to have a group of students, primary level, secondary level, invest students and try to disseminate information on open access journals and all these electronic resources using the, their own resources like phones, uh, laptops. So in other ways, we are saying invest librarians felt the that the digital, lack of digital literary skills and slow internet speed were the major barriers in their transition from physical to online. This is how they feel. But yes, uh, the digital uh, the platforms are quite important. They are quite nourished uh, in their own operations, but uh, they have their own short force because not everyone uh, can access them. So that's uh, 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 one Ask a Librarian WhatsApp uh, group, uh, which uh, subject librarians and even uh, those who are well versed can just ask it what they use that one. This is a great Zimbabwe invest uh, a chat a chat uh, chat for where uh, they connect their uh, users. Then suggestion about the future plans and opportunities as my last slide. So Zimla now is saying what can we do? Can we talk of collaboration? Can we talk of uh, coming together as librarians? So that we can be, be prepared for this pandemic. You know, Zimbabwe was even affected by uh, that uh, fl the, those floods, and uh, we, after that, we had this uh, coronavirus. So, as librarians, there are a lot of things that we should do to collaborate. Like this uh, meeting which we have, it must be spread to everyone. If we can get a record, then we can send to librarians so that they can view and see how other libraries have operated and are still operating. But of course, this financial, there's some financial implications, but as librarians, I think we should sit down and help each other as African uh, librarians. 
So librarians are now retooling and learning digital skills for webinars and e-learning platforms. As you realize, there's joy and go. Also noted that they, in order to minimize challenges caused by the changing trends, it's a changing trend. There is also use of WhatsApp and Facebook, Twitter platform for daily communication with certain library clients. Through WhatsApp group, uh, librarians are able to share information. However, this comes with challenges on cost, data, bandwidth, and whatever. This is what we are now saying as collaborators, as in collaboration, let's try to find ways in which we can work together to find our users and then run away from our competitors. Because people are finding it easy to just send information, even though they are not librarians to uh, patrol. Not many librarians are able to afford Wi-Fi services in their homes, that is Zimbabwe, for use uh, of the internet and other services. Email services for most librarians are not easy outside their workplace. So I'm talking of access here. These are some of the challenges. But then from this meeting, I think we're going to have some other solutions from other uh, panelists so that we can now uh, maintain our, our data and also our library services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shadrach. Um, that was interesting um, to see what our, our um, colleagues above Limpombo River are currently doing to meet the, the... So if I can quickly then go back because we are just five minutes beyond our schedule. So I, I, I know that we normally have asked people to to hang on. Um, I'll try and tackle the questions that were on the chat. The very first one was from my boss. Um, uh, welcome, uh, comrade boss. Uh, now we can see you. Um, the first question was, is that all academics spend a significant amount of their budget on electronic resources? Considering the open access or open science movement, what will be the future impact? So, Prof wants to find out what what do, what do you think will be the future impact of open access, seeing that uh, most uh, institutions are using quite a large significant of their budget uh, uh, on electronic resources. Then there was another comment from, from the National Librarian. He says, I think it was in addition to what uh, Ujala was saying, we need to form part of our institutional development in business continuity plan, which is cognizance of thinking of the future pandemic, partnership, resource sharing, and uh, data backup storage. And then there was a comment from Marcus Mapile, for, ac for academic libraries, effective collaboration is no longer an option, but a necessity. How could we rally academic libraries to collaborate in navigation cost issues and share best practice towards dealing with pandemics and other disruptions? Those were the three comments and, 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 and I'll open up the floor to the, to the panelists. <laughs> Ujala is smiling. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie and Colly. The, the, the issue of subscriptions and electronic resources and the mainstream academic publishing model that prevails all need to be considered very carefully within the context of higher education, research areas, research output, and our responsibility as a country. Um, these are these issues are under discussion via Sandlick and the issue around open access publishing and transformative agreements uh, are very much on the agenda. We've had some national discussions around this and we have considered that based our, on our research output as a country we are still not in a position to make wide scale exits from from subscription models etc and our subscriptions 
Um, and so we are investigating also what what is the actual implication of transformative agreements? What is the path to transformation for us towards that transformative agreements and what would be the implications for us? As a country, we need to take stock of our research outputs and do we have the kind of clout to be able to state to some of our vendors that we will walk away from the deals that you have on the table. And it is a tenuous position to be in. For example, at the moment, we are in negotiations with Elsevier regarding a critical, critical uh, medical um, resource. And because we need it, and Elsevier has been instituting individual agreements with, in, with, with universities, we are saying, let's go to it as a consortium. Let's negotiate a consortium deal. And so would we then, if they turn around and say, you know what, we don't accept what you're putting on the table, are we as institutions united enough, firstly, to say we all pull away from the deal? Or are we so uh, committed to our own roots towards supporting our researchers, et cetera, and we say, okay, they don't want that we continue individually. We need to reach that point of, uni of unified thinking to be able to say, we can challenge the, the service providers and the vendors based on our withdrawal from deals. And if we want to work in terms of collaboration, we'd say you speak to our consortium, not to us individually. So the, the, the collective purchasing part, the, the power of a collective deal is very crucial. And we all need to be on the same, uh, same page in that regard. The transformer, we need to also secondly understand how does a transformative agreement work? It doesn't mean if we go that route that we are going to be paying less because you are still going to be paying your APCs, et cetera, as part of that. And you are still going to be, it, the, the, the fact that you would be making it immediately available as an open access article in a journal that is hosted by a business entity there's a bit of a contradiction in there because we're still paying more. We, we've realized we've done some of the numbers. So what we need to start looking at as a country, we, we do need access to research outputs which are contained and held within journals and mainstream subscriptions. We cannot deny that. If we're going on a very strong research trajectory, et cetera, there is an element where we say we do need those journals. It's not only about access to a limited number of articles or, or an X number of journals. For research to flourish, our researchers need not worry about access to, to, to research outputs and to create new research. So that's a very real conversation. For me, what is important, Corley, is what are the research imperatives of the country? What is that trajectory? And how do we as universities, how are we then engaging with that research trajectory? What is the focus areas of research? And then only we can start saying, OK, this is how we support that. <clears throat> and unless and until we don't have a national conversation, we can we can talk until the cows come home about open science and open access, etc. We're all doing as much as we can, but in the absence of a national research strategy, research trajectory, areas of research, where are our researchers publishing, what are the support that they need, etc., we will always have this debate. I'm sorry, there is no one solution for it because it's challenging also mainstream academic publishing uh, participation, but also in terms of ad hominem promotions, etc. What is being, 
what is the main mainstream thinking in the academy around ad homes, around promotions, etc. What is the publishing patterns that we are seeing? Who's involved in editorial boards, etc. So the whole academic publishing paradigm also has to be challenged. And so there are different facets to it. And so we need to have that national conversation. Thank you. Was there anything else I needed to respond to? Charlie, you mute. Yeah, I think that, thank you, Ojala. I, I think that was on, uh, others will just comment from, okay. from Marcus and, and, and Kepi. But um, I'm, I'm glad that um, the, 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 the librarians and, 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 and managers in terms of the South African national licensing, you guys are, are looking at that. I think you are correct to say, unless we pull together as a nation, we, we are unlikely to, to, to win. I, I, and and uh, what I've seen, you, um, uh, what Senlik, what you guys are doing at Senlik in terms of the clinical key, I, I think it's 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 showing results a little bit. It's taking longer than we we, we had hoped for, but it's showing results. To mm. say when you pull together, we mm. we we have strength. We cannot be um, uh, pushed aside. Um, do we have any question? Um, I think we've got one that has come through. Um, well, I can break in the meantime, whilst I'm trying to find this question that we we our our university has has been able to give us uh, some couple of millions to automate our library so oh. come 2022 we our library will be fully automated we we are going rfid um and therefore the the other staff that were doing the manual part we will reskill them uh, in in implementing the process so so we, 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 you, you would come and benchmark. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Wonderful. <laughs> um, the question was, uh, Mulatudi, I don't see your question because you've used a font. Uh, I don't wear glasses. Can you, can you unmute yourself and ask the question, Mulatudi? Or can you read it? <laughs> I see you're getting nearer. <laughs> Mulatudi? I think while Mulatudi is still trying to read, I just wanted to also make an input on the on the supply chain issue. Uh, and I think I, I you know I concur with you, Jal. I think we have not taken advantage of the economy of scale that the both the public sector in terms of community library and university has in ensuring that we access this. Uh, databases at the at, 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 at the bargaining, uh, and and I'm saying this because I've been in a public library space. Uh, uh, Ninety percent of public libraries are used by university students, and, and 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 at what point do we collaborate to such a point that there is a seamless integration? Uh, mm. For for I mean now we know. Uh, the the academic program has changed altogether. Uh, we know for most of the students will feel comfortably to be at home doing online tutorial if they are given that option. I mean the homeschooling paradigm has been with us forever, and we are, we are going to see it now. Uh, we have cousins who are studying overseas. And I can tell you that for their four-year degrees, they will never travel uh, to Australia during the undergraduate because of the online platform that has been made possible by the, the COVID. But I'm just saying that I think, uh, we, like, like Joel is saying, I think we really need to zoom into how do we honestly create this dialogue in taking advantage of the economy of scale, the power that the library sector has in the economy of this country and, and, and putting all our aids together in the rents and cents and and, 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 and and demonstrating that we are in economy on ourselves. Thank mm. you. Mm. The, 
Thank you, KP. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Um, uh, we have to, we're already 30 minutes behind schedule, so we will stop exactly at three. Um, somebody has been nice and, 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 send, and send a question to me with a screenshot. <laughs> What has been your biggest, this is, this is innovation. Um, what has been your biggest challenge that you, you have you solved by applying technology during this time? Is this a new technological solution or did you expand on the existing solution to meet the current needs? I think chat track, we, we, let's give you that first opportunity. The question is, what, ha, what has been your biggest challenge that you solve by applying technology during this time. Is this the new technology solution or it was an existing solution? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, like I said in Zimbabwe, we face um, uh, the problem of connectivity. But of course, the biggest challenge uh, was when we have students who are out in rural areas, out of the town, out of the physical library, uh, per se. So this was the biggest challenge we faced. But because of technology, you will find we managed to connect to with some of the students who we feel were, were, were eager to learn or to continue their studies. But uh, most of them dropped, and uh, we have uh, figures, a uh, number of figures of students who dropped, and some are even uh, out of school. So that's what the biggest challenge. But because of technology, as I said, librarians were being innovative, co collaborating with IT guys, trying to find solutions to how they can connect and also offer uh, some strategic uh, solutions to the invest management. Uh, even uh, institutional management on how they can reach or disseminate information in using various tools. But the biggest challenge is that they use uh, open sources, they use their own resources. We don't have that funding. When you are talking of 20 some millions pumped into your library, we don't have that kind of a budget because we are having a very bad time in terms of our economy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. I think we, we have to end it here, but I would be failing in my duty if I don't give uh, Dr. Engela uh, an opportunity to reflect. Uh, is one of our TVC research who has been with us since one o'clock. It would be nice to just to get a reflection from her. Dr. Engela. Okay, it doesn't seem to be online now. Uh, Marcus, closing remarks. Thank you very much, colleagues, and thank you to our panelists for making today uh, very special. And uh, we are hopeful that uh, this is the first installment uh, uh, towards libraries making time to, to meet in this way, just to engage and share ideas. And as the li National lab Librarian has indicated, we do need some form of a national dialogue just to deal with the issues around us. So I'm, I'm very happy that uh, today is successful. Uh, for those who would require uh, this recording they can email us and we'll forward so that then they are able to share with their colleagues and use it as a knowledge base towards addressing their many issues so this is the first installment like i said you will be receiving many other um, requests for engagements and we'll try to bring as many experts as possible and thank you very much ujala and the national librarian and shadrach uh, you've been wonderful and uh, we really appreciate as the university of the free state for for you to come and, and and share your experiences with us so thank you very much charlie and also for sterling work thank you thank you just last one um, uh, comment from the our director Jeanette. Uh, thank
thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Uh, let me take this opportunity uh, and, and, and really thank uh, our national librarian, uh, Mr. Gepimadumo. Thank you for making time to come and share your experience and your expertise and the developments that are happening at the National Library uh, in line with uh, COVID-19. We have really learned a lot from your experiences and we are very, very grateful that really you made time to, uh, to join us in this uh, panel discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, Ujala, thank you so much for also uh, coming on board and sharing your experiences uh, with us um, from the UCT. And as we know that UCT is one of the highly rated universities around the world, and then most of us draw inspiration from a uh, UCT. And like Charlie has mentioned, we have communicated via email during the week about uh, uh, the disaster that happened at um, a UCT. You are in our thoughts and you are in our prayers uh, as the University of the Free State Libraries. And like Charlie was saying, we can share resources, we can share skills. You are welcome to contact us. We are also busy with other projects. Like he said, we are going virtual. We are really going into the virtual space. So thank you for sharing uh, your developments with us, your business continuity plan, your strategy on virtual library services. We have really gained a lot. I think maybe we might make contact in, in a short space. Uh, Shadrach, uh, Mr. Ndinde from Zimbabwe, thank you so much for making time and, and making sure that, you know, despite the challenges that you have been in, uh, informing us about uh, uh, power cards, you, you really made pushed and make sure that you come and share with us the uh, 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 Zimbabwean experience. It's, 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 it's really broadening our, our, our horizon that, you know, we should move beyond uh, the borders. I think um, if uh, Liasa president was here, Miss Nikki, she, you know, we could we could uh, speak another language, including our president, uh, Aflia, Mr. Mandan Tombel. So from my side as the University of the Free State uh, Library Director, I just want to take this opportunity opportunity to thank you. Uh, colleagues who have joined, uh, Professor Engela, Dr. Engela, thank you for also joining us, Professor Corley in absentia. I also want to uh, extend a really a, a word of appreciation for you joining our virtual space. And I also want to thank the LIASA members from all over the, 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 the country and then the, the branch members for joining. And lastly, I would want to thank the, the library staff and the team that has organized this event. I'm really taking off my head for you. I'm really applauding the wonderful and amazing work that we have done. And from my side, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you to everyone. Um, till we meet again in the next session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, colleagues, and bye. Thank you, Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, KP. Thank you, everyone. Hi, yeah, Jade. Thank you. I know.